Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, good evening from India. Shalom, everyone. Um, this is Rivka, Chairwoman of Herut India. A warm welcome to all of you, some first timers here and some who have been here from the, the, the first time we started uh, the webinars online. Um, so first of all, um, we, we, uh, we are going to start the webinar and then later we have a question and um, a discussion, question and answer kind of session. So um, I'll introduce Herut first, the organization, the movement where um, the umbrella where, where we come under. Um, Herut is an international movement for Jewish unity, Zionist pride, protecting the Jewish people worldwide and Zionist education. Herut operates per the ideals of the pre-World War II Zionist leader and philosopher Zev Jabotinsky. And I would like to introduce my good friend, Lauren, an unapologetic Zionist. Lauren Isaacs is the National Director of Herut Canada and the coordinator for World Herut in Israel. She has worked in the Israel advocacy field for many years as a Zionist activist and public speaker. Lauren made Alia at the age of 24 and currently lives in Yerushalayim. Lauren empower, empowers young activists, debunks harmful lies about Israel and effectively proves the anti-Semitic agenda of the BDS movement, both on and off university campuses, in the media, and as an unapologetic Zionist. She continues to split her time between Israel and Canada. So without much, uh, let's not waste time here. Um, we have people coming in. So welcome everyone and let us start. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you so much, Rivka. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here as always. I love Hiru India, love Rivka and what she's doing. She's just an amazing woman. Uh, thank you all for being here. So today the topic is the Israel apartheid lie or the lies surrounding that rhetoric. And Rivka, can I share my screen? Um, if I can share my screen, then we can get going. Shalom Karma. Oh, there we go. Shalom, Rivka. Shalom, Lauren. Shalom, Shalom Karma, our amazing director and, and uh, executive in chief here with us. It's amazing. Thank you all for coming. Cool. Okay, so today, as yeah. I said, today's topic is the Israel apartheid lie. And this is probably the most common, the most pervasive, the most dangerous, and the most easily debunkable lie that we hear about Israel in the news, in the media, on university campuses, pretty much everywhere we go. If someone has an accusation against Israel, they have a problem with Israel, they are going to use the word apartheid in some form. And it is completely erroneous. It is completely baseless. It's a malicious lie. And they're attempting to take a very serious issue, South African apartheid, which is a very real thing, and use it uh, uh, in, in its direction towards Israel. And it's actually a big, uh, it's actually very inappropriate and very offensive to South Africans considering what happened there up until 1994. Uh, but anyway, let's let's get into that. So what is the claim? When people say Israel apartheid, what are they actually saying? Well, most people who are saying this don't actually know what they're saying. If you ask them to define apartheid, they define it incorrectly. Um, but here is the one of the official definitions from Merriam-Webster, and it is basically racial legal segregation, separating two or more groups of people based on the color of their skin alone and putting in place laws that prevent certain people of certain color skin from doing certain things. So in apartheid South Africa, up until 1994, there was racially segregated laws that were enforced. Black people could not drink from white water fountains. Black people...
Lauren, I think we lost you. Lauren. We have a frozen Lauren. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope she comes back soon. Yeah. Lauren's back. Yeah. There she is. Sorry about that. I uh, guess my <laughs> internet went out. I was just talking to myself all of a sudden. <laughs> okay. So let us re-screen share. Apologies for that. I hope we uh, that doesn't happen again. Okay. So where was I? The definition of apartheid. Um, Anyway, the sign on the bottom of the screen here is from South Africa in the days of South African apartheid. And it's written in Afrikaans at the bottom and English at the top. And it says white beat, the white area. This beach was only for white people. And there was a separate area on the beach that black people were allowed to go. This is what apartheid means, separating people based on the color of their skin. Now, there is a claim that this exists in Israel. It is completely untrue. It is actually so much the opposite because in Israel, everyone is integrated with everyone. Whatever your race, whatever your gender, whatever your nationality, whatever your skin color, whatever your sex, doesn't matter. Everyone is integrated in every aspect of life. And you can't even tell, you know, walking down the street, all Middle Eastern people basically look the same. Let's be honest. You cannot tell who's Israeli, who's Arab, who's Jewish, who's not. There is no form of apartheid in Israel whatsoever. However, the notion that it does exist, exists around the world. This is just uh, from one university in America. However, on almost every single university campus in North America, also in Europe, in South America, they have something called Israel Apartheid Week. And it is an entire week dedicated to pushing this false propagandist narrative that Israel is an apartheid place obviously untrue. They have nothing to back this up. It is just one sort of way that they can spew hatred against Israel by using a word, by using a term that triggers people, that offends people because, oh my God, apartheid was so bad. And that's true. So if we connect that with Israel, immediately people take a dim view of Israel, right? So it's very intelligent propaganda to connect something so terrible with Israel, even though it has nothing to do with Israel. So my answer to this is always there are different approaches and different Jewish organizations do this in different ways. And I 100% stand by be offensive, not defensive in your answer when it comes to apartheid. We do not say, okay, we hear this accusation all the time, right? Israel is an apartheid state. The thing not to say is, oh my God, no, it's not because, you know, we have this and we have a gay pride parade and please don't hate us because we, we have Arab governments and Arab doctors. That's nice. And that's very true, but it's also very weak. It's very passive. It's trying to justify, it's trying to justify our existence and our right to exist and why the truth is the truth. The truth doesn't need to be justified. It speaks for itself. The fact is Israel is not apartheid. So when someone lobbies that accusation, I immediately go on the offense and take that narrative and run with it. I say, let's talk about the people and the places calling Israel apartheid. That is the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, the Palestinian uh, nationalist movement, that camp in and of itself. Let's talk about them. If you want to talk about apartheid, let's talk about the place where we can see discrimination, segregation, and legal oppression, which comes from the Palestinian camp, uh, ergo the Palestinian governments. Um, not necessarily all Palestinian people, I'm referring to the government who oppress the Palestinian people themselves, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria. So we're taking an offensive, not a defensive stance. I want to talk about Gaza. How many churches are in Gaza? How many churches are functioning in Gaza? How many synagogues are in Gaza? How many Jews live in Gaza? You want to talk about apartheid, let's talk about the real apartheid, where there is Palestinian governance in Israel, there is segregation, there is oppression, and there is systematic removal of Jews and anyone, not even Jews, anyone who doesn't align with the Palestinian government's ideologies. So you can see here, uh, I put on the screen, I, I hope you can read it, that the Christian population has been growing in one place in the Middle East, and that's in Israel, and it's fantastic. 
The Christian population grew by 1.4% in Israel, Israel proper, in 2020. In Bethlehem, however, when Bethlehem went under the Palestinian Authority control, the population uh, has decreased significantly, significantly, shockingly decreased. Why? Because the Palestinian Authority has apartheid-like policies that discriminate against non-Arab conforming ideologies, non-Muslim ideologies mostly, especially in Gaza. So we could talk about other religions, right? When people say Israel apartheid, I wanna talk about how other religions are treated under Palestinian governance. How are non-Muslims treated? We can also talk about the LGBTQ community. And I don't wanna say, oh, well, Israel throws a gay pride parade. That's wonderful, but I don't need to say that. I wanna talk about the fact that gay people get burned alive in Gaza. That's what I want to talk about. You want to talk about apartheid? No apartheid has ever been as bad. No one, I mean, in South Africa, apartheid was terrible in the policies they had. But I'll tell you this, no one was burning people alive for being gay. That is just a whole new level of systematic discrimination. And again, it is the closest thing we have to apartheid in this country. And it comes from mm -hmm. one source and one source only. And that is not Israel, the Israeli government. It is not there. All right. So we could talk about the LGBTQ community. We could talk about women. And again, I'm not trying to uh, be on par with, oh, we all have these shared values in a defensive way. I want to be offensive and say, how are women treated under the Palestinian Authority? If you're lobbying the accusation of Israel apartheid and you're telling me you have a problem with Israeli policies, let's talk about the policies of women in our two neighbors, all right? The Palestinian Authority government right over there and Hamas in Gaza over there because women are not treated well. That is to say the least. They are not free. They are not treated well. They do not, they do not have equal rights. They do not have legal equal rights or social equal rights or cultural equal rights. And that's a problem to me. And besides it being a problem to me, whether you care about that or not, apartheid does not exist in Israel. However, our neighbor, to, the, to our neighbor to the West, it does exist against women, against uh, different religions, against people of different political ideologies. And it's amazing that people just ignore that fact and choose to focus on this fake Israel apartheid. And they're ignoring this unbelievably mind blowing oppression going on right next door. So we can do that. And, and also, I, I always find it, I don't know if we can call it ironic or hypocritical or just honestly mind boggling that the people claiming Israeli apartheid are the ones who want Jew-free areas. They want full-on Jew-free areas. The Palestinian Authority government makes no qualms about the fact that they want land that's completely Jew-free. Peace will only come for them where they can build houses and have government and have structure with not a Jew on the, on the land, not a Jew in sight. That is, if that's not, that's even more than apartheid. That's just outrageous. That's Germany 1934 when they were just mass ethnic genocide Jews. So the fact is, it's, it's quite hypocritical to uh, the fact that the people vying for these policies are the ones always be the first to claim Israeli apartheid. And these are pictures over here from last summer and the summer before of the Palestinian uh, Authority. And actually, these were both in Gaza of the Gazans. Um, flying Nazi swastika flags during protests. So it speaks for themselves, right? These images speak for themselves. And these are the images we need to show the world. When I go onto university campuses and people talk Israel apartheid, you think I don't have this picture waiting and ready, big blown up board of this picture? Because there is one group of people that um, claims to be, to enjoy, to be a part of, to revere a an ethnic cleansing, discriminatory, um, ideology, and that is not the Israeli government. It is actually our neighbors, which is very interesting. So again, people, Israeli apartheid this, Israel discrimination that. Let's look at the charters. Let's look at the foundational documents. Let's look at what the country is built upon, because that really speaks to the inherent values of a place. Now, let me preface this by saying, that's not to say if someone has a charter that says wonderful things, that they're actually gonna do wonderful things. You know, people write all sorts of things all over the place and don't follow them. However, the Israeli foundational charter, one of them, one of the important documents in Israel's reestablishment and founding history is the Declaration of Independence. Do they follow what they say in that? Do they practice what they preach? I maintain that yes, 
They do. And we can see that through statistics. We can see that through the job market. We can see that through demographics. Uh, I've highlighted the important parts here of Israel's Declaration of Independence that I want to point to. At the beginning, it says uh, Israel will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, regardless, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions. Even before moving on from that, is that true? Does Israel do that? We can say for certain, yes. Israel safeguards the holy places of every religion. Christians are protected in order to make pilgrimage and go to their holy churches every day of the year. Muslims are protected to go pray on the Dome of the Rock at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Temple Mount every single day. They are protected and allowed to do that because the Israeli police and the Israeli government wants them to be able to do that. We allow people into this country, doesn't matter religion, race, sex, you can get whatever job you want, be in any sector you want, be as successful as you want, doesn't matter. It goes on, the charter, the Israeli Declaration of Independence goes on to say, uh, we appeal in the midst of the onslaught launched against us because this charter was issued, right, during the war, during the War of Independence, while we had our neighboring Arab countries attacking us and literally trying to kill us and wipe us off the map, they are still writing in the Declaration of Independence that we appeal the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to preserve peace and participation, to help us build the nation up and they will have due representation, equal citizenship in all permanent institutions. They're saying, despite the war going on, all the Arab citizens will have equal representation in institutions. Is that true today? 100%. The third largest party in the government is an Arab party that actually calls for Israel's destruction in the Knesset on a daily basis. And yet they have representation. There are Arab judges and teachers and lawyers and doctors. In every sector, you can find a whole mix of people. There is nowhere, nowhere in any sector of Israeli life where there is division based on race, based on skin color. And that is the very definition of apartheid. That is the definition of apartheid. <laughs> we are disproving that claim, right? It just doesn't exist in Israel. And of course, uh, it goes on to Galvo. everyone and we want uh, full cooperation with everyone. Now, let's juxtapose this to the other charters, to the Palestinian National Charter, the PLO Charter, which is still functioning today in Judea and Samaria, what people call the West Bank. And let's look at the Hamas founding charter as well, which is the other Palestinian government in Gaza. So the Hamas Charter, you can read it online. I always encourage everyone to read it. Go online and, and Google the Hamas Charter. These are just a few excerpts from that charter, and you can read and enjoy. It is a horrific, violent, genocidal charter that calls for the destruction of Israel. It calls for the killing of Jews. It calls for the end of Western democratic values. It says they will wipe Israel and the Jews off the map and then they will come for America. It is a, a horrifically violent and intolerant charter. That, you know, compared to the Israeli uh, Declaration of Independence, it's night and day. It's apples and oranges. You cannot compare. One is intrinsically good and saying we want the betterment of everyone and we will include them in all aspects of society. And then you've got the Hamas Charter, which says we will murder Jews. We will be violent until the state of Israel is destroyed. I mean, it's not comparable, really, if you look at it. And these are just a few things. Uh, in the intro of the Charter, of the Hamas Charter, it says our struggle against the Jews is great and serious. They don't even pretend that it's against Israelis. They outline that they want the destruction of Jewish people. Um, and you can uh, read this as well. Please find the charter online. It is an amazing thing to read because it really speaks to the character of the government right next door to Israel. For people who say that the Palestinian National Charter, the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Liberation Organization is more moderate, I fervently disagree. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Palestinian Authority now is not more moderate than Hamas. They have a pay for slay policy where they pay terrorists to murder Jews. They also pay terrorists in attempting to murder Jews, even if they don't succeed. The Palestinian Authority will give those terrorists and their families money. So they are not more moderate. They are also a terrorist institution that calls for the destruction of Israel. And these are just a few 
articles uh, from the charter, from the Palestinian National Charter that is still active today, right? And, and it's so funny, in Article 22, they claim Israel is a constant source of threat vis-a-vis -vis peace in the Middle East and the whole world. They are claiming that Israel is the source of danger in the entire world, you know, even though they have a, a pay for slay terrorist policy. It's just unbelievable. But you can read this online. And if you write to me after, I can also send you both charters if you want to read them in full. Um, so it's important to discuss that. One moment. Now, as I said, it's not just the Palestinian, uh, it, when you say something and when you write something down in a charter, it doesn't necessarily mean you're good and you're moral and you're virtuous. If Israel wrote down wonderful things about, you know, equity and equality and inclusion, but then did the opposite, then I would say, okay, words aren't matching actions. So are the Palestinian government's words matching their actions? And the answer is yes, unfortunately, yes. And we can see here just a few quotes from Pal the Palestinian leadership themselves. And these are actually, I think all three of these quotes, I know at least the two on the right side here are available on YouTube. You can see the YouTube videos of these people calling for the absolute destruction and violent genocidal death of Jews. And these are recent. This is uh, the bottom one is from 2019. Uh, actually, all three of them are from 2019, uh, during the uprisings on the Gaza border. Now, they are not only saying we will kill Jews, they're saying we're going to tear their hearts out. One of the leaders, I believe it was also Yahya Sinwar, he said that we will eat the livers of Jews. When we breach the border, we're going to eat their livers. They literally want to come and eat our internal organs. That's the violent rhetoric being pushed pushed on this side. And again, we are still talking about the claim of Israeli apartheid. See what we're talking about now? I am not in a defensive position. And I am not saying, oh, please love us. Please understand that we have a wonderful society. No, I am pointing to the people next to us, our neighbors and our enemies. This is what they claim. It is important that we highlight this when discussing the Israel apartheid narrative, right? Uh, Fatih Hamad is the military leader of the Hamas military wing. And he has a famous video, you can see it on YouTube, it's terrible. He says he appeals to the Palestinian people in Israel and he appeals to them around the world. And he says, a knife is only five shekels. Is the throat of a Jew not worth five shekels? That's what he says in this video. He's basically saying it costs very little money to go pick up a knife and kill a Jew. This is the leadership on these sides of the borders. And when we talk about Israel apartheid, this is what I wanna hear you guys talking about. This is the, the discussion we need to be having in the media and on university campuses, because this really gets to the heart of the matter, right? This gets, cutting away all the other nonsense, we get to the core of the issue, which is the fact that we are sitting next to a very oppressive, dictatorial, segregatory, violent government on our, our borders, right? Or within our borders, I should say. So uh, that is uh, what I will come to in the end when we're having this discussion. Know your facts, know your history, because that's important as well. Y you can say all this stuff, but without a little knowledge of Israeli history or Arab Israeli history, we'll uh, potentially fall on death. Uh, someone is Rivka, can you mute that for, oh, thank you. Um, so we have to know a little bit of the history, especially when we're trying to have these conversations in academic environments, whether it's a school or a community meeting or you know on social media, we are trying to have intellectual discussions. So know a little bit of the history, know the facts, know the founding documents of Israel, know the history in the region, but also never be defensive. We don't have to defend our right to exist. We don't have to defend our right to walk around as safe, proud Jews. No one else defends their right to exist on a daily basis. So why should we never take the defensive stance, only take the offensive stance that's not, God forbid, being violent. It's educating and shining a light on the real issues instead of allowing a light to be shine on the fake issues with regard to Israel. And you can see in this picture that I have here just shows some of the diversity of Israel uh, in the Israeli army. You've got Jews, non-Jews, Arabs, Druze, 
Bedouins, women, men, black, white, young, old. You've got everyone who serves in the army to protect Israel because everyone knows the importance of national service. And you can see this is a famous picture on the right hand side on, on the bus. You know, the religious Hasidic man sitting next to a secular soldier sitting next to a, a Muslim woman. And that is exactly the character of Israel that speaks to Israel. It immediately disproves the false narrative of apartheid. And then we can turn our attention to focusing on the real issues, which is the apartheid, which is the segregation of the governments that uh, are on within our borders, the Palestinian governments, and even further afield. Uh, I don't want to get into the whole geopolitical situation of the Middle East right now, but I mean, just look at Iran, just look at Afghanistan, just look at Saudi Arabia. We don't even need to point to, I mean, real apartheid-like regimes Everyone always focuses on Israel and it's ridiculous. So that, that is where I'll end. And I, I spoke to you now, but I wanna speak with you and I wanna see if we can uh, engage, if there are any questions, if we can have a dialogue, if people agree or disagree with me, or maybe you've had your own experience hearing about this narrative and, and what you have to say about that. So thank you, uh, Rivka, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. That was very interesting and um, it's touched my heart. Thank you so much. Um, I'm opening up questions to the floor. Any one of you have questions, have thoughts on this subject? You can type it. You can type it in the chat if you I don't think, want I to. I think speak. Rosalind. I think Rosalind has a question. Yes, well, Rosalind. You, you are one of the best speakers I've ever heard in my life. Is this a talk that you just gave, which is brief and perfect, something that we can share from Cheirut? Are we able to share that? Is that something I would love to be able to send your talk to other people? Is that some, or, or you tell me how to do it? Or do we invite oh. you to come and speak again? What your words need to be shared with people so they understand what the situation is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I can I uh, interject, Rosalind? I'll send you the link when it's done. Okay, okay. just just Thank leave you so your much. your email. May I just share something, Rivka? May I just interject? Of course, of course. Thank you so much. Um, Rosalind, thank you so much. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Lauren right now, but I'm only doing that as the uh, head of the movement. Um, invite Lauren to speak, please. Um, the more people that hear Lauren and the more that our leaders speak up, the more people will be educated and we're honored and very, very happy to, you know, show up in every home, be it in a webinar or in person, please. Thank you. Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And definitely be in touch. Uh, you can email me. I'm going to put all the contact information right now in the chat for everyone. You can email me, find me on social media. You can find me through the Hirut Canada website as well. I'm going to put it all there right now. Okay, Liji has a question here or uh, a comment. It's clear and it's loud and clear that not, not only Israel, but other Arab nations are against Israel, but why are the Arab nations loud against Israel. Why are they why are they louder? Yeah. Excellent question. Excellent question. Well, first of all, uh, volume does come with uh, quantity and they have a lot more voices than we do. We all know Israel makes up uh, a tiny, tiny little sliver of the Middle East and the world at large, to be honest, to, uh, geographically, it's almost insignificant. If you look at the map of the world, it's the size of New Jersey. Our population is teeny tiny. Please God, that's improving and increasing as more Jews make Aliyah and come live in Israel and as more people give birth and we have a new generation here but unfortunately we are few we are a small people we're a small country we're a small nation and the jewish people themselves represent a tiny 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 uh fraction of a percentage of the entire world so number one numbers matter when there are uh, nine billion people on this planet and you know there are two billion muslims for example standing up uh, as a unified voice 
We can't compete with that, you know, in our volume. We are 15 million Jews, and that is a fraction of a percent. And that's if all the Jews around the world stood up in unison and said the same thing. But unfortunately, we don't. We're fractured in our own communities, and there's only a portion of a portion of those Jews standing up and saying these things. So why are they louder? They have more people. Also, they have a cause that people get behind in the media, on social media. It's a very easy cause to get behind. Jews have always been scapegoated since time immemorial. Jews have been the ones to be pointed at to say Jews are causing the problems, right? Whether it was in capitalism or in socialism, uh, whether it was economic, whether it was social, whether it was racial, whether it was wars, whether it was anything. Jews have been scapegoated and people say the Jews are the problem. Now we have Israel. Now we have a defensible country made up of Jewish people and a, a Jewish uh, persona, I would say. It's not a Jewish religious country, but it is a Jewish national country. And people now point to Israel and say, Israel is responsible for the problems. Israel is responsible for all the ills of the world. Israel is responsible for all the wars. And people can get behind that. They rally around a common cause, which is age old anti-Semitism just manifesting itself as modern day hatred of Israel. So it's nothing new. This has been going on for years and years and years. And again, with their size and volume, uh, they really do make an impact you know, in the media and in different places. All we can do is try to promote the truth. We can try to promote peace, peace, we could try to correct the misinformation and the incorrect narratives, and we can show unity and strength and pride because we are standing on the right side of history. We are standing on the moral side of history, and that's amazing. That should feel good to us, even though sometimes we feel like the little guy, you know, David and Goliath, we really are, but David was right, and David succeeded, and so will we. So that, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> Okay, um, Niji has another question. Why doesn't the government of Israel stand strong against them? Why are they not heard by the international media? I mean, not visible in the international media about their cause, about their truth. Excellent question. I don't think there's anyone who complains about the, uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I think I froze. Hello? Yes, we can, Lauren. We oh, can. excellent. Thank you. Um, I don't think anyone complains about the weakness of the Israeli government more than Israelis themselves. And I think that's excellent. I think it's a good thing that we are criticizing our government. I think it pushes towards reforms and I think it pushes towards improvement. Uh, governments are fallible, governments are man. They're just people, right? They're not perfect, they're not gods. They're people and most of the time they're idiots and they're corrupt people. And that it holds true in Israel's history as well as the history of governments around the world. Why isn't the government doing anything about these things? In my opinion, and I speak for myself right now, I think our government is weak when it comes to terrorism. I don't think they are strong enough in their handling of it or in their uh, tactics to dissuade terrorists. That's my opinion. I hope we can change that through positive reforms in the Knesset, in public opinion. But, you know, that's the beauty of the, well, the beauty and the pitfalls of the democratic system in that these people get elected and then they make policy decisions, which are not great sometimes. And yes, I believe we need a stronger, more uh, government that's more vehemently and loudly against violence, against terrorism, against people encroaching on our rights and our borders. Please God, we'll get that uh, someday. I agree the government's not great. And in every country around the world, you know, the governments have problems. Thank you, Lauren. I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier um, that the population of Christians in Gaza has decreased. Okay, how are they, what, what, how are they decreasing the populations in Gaza? Are they being thrown out? Are being, they being forced from their homes? Um, what's the MO? Excellent question. So the statistic that I showed there was uh, regarding Bethlehem. So that's not actually in Gaza. That's in Judea and Samaria in what people call the West Bank. Um, but yes, Gaza and the government in Gaza and the government that governs over Judea and Samaria are a little different in their tactics of that. Um, but there are sort of two basic premises that these governments have what they've done to ensure that there's no dissension in religion or religious ideology. Um, there have been, I would say, destructions, closures, and just bulldozing buildings when, you know, when the Hamas takes over in Gaza, 
and they bulldoze a church and they just knock it down. It's very difficult to come out and be openly Christian after that. They make it a very, very difficult environment. Also, when the legal religion of the stated in the Constitution, where they say, you know, not of a country because they're not a country, thank God, of their own, but they have a, a constitution of their own, whatever they claim is their own autonomy. And in that, they say that the religion of our institution, of our people, of our movement is Islam. So again, it's very hard for people to come out and say they're openly Christian because they are discriminated against. They are oppressed, there's violence. There's lots of violence against non-Muslims in Gaza, unfortunately. Also, they've closed, obviously, when the Jews were shipped out of Gaza, um, when they were completely immorally and unlawfully kicked out of Gaza, they just shut and destroyed all the synagogues. They're gone. Okay, those don't exist anymore. And so too with the Christians and the churches and other religions as well. There are no, you know, Baha'i temples going on in Gaza right now because there's one religion, the religion that dominates is Islam. It is the religion of the Hamas party and they don't tolerate anything else. Um, I think sometimes we come at it from a kind of a Western or not even a Western, a very tolerant uh, mind, uh, mindset, right? You think, what would we do? How would you govern it? How could you enforce something like that? You would never conceive of doing such things because you're a moral person, right? It doesn't even enter our minds to just oppress people based on their religion, but they do that with no qualms in uh, Gaza and in Judea and Samaria. They say the religion is Islam. No one's allowed to be anything else. They kick them out, they convert them, they make it impossible for them to practice their religion, they threaten them with violence or with real violence. All these things together over the years decrease the populations that aren't Muslim, unfortunately. And uh, that's not to say uh, anything bad about Muslims. Be, be Muslim if you want to be, but allow other people to have their religions as well, right? Thank you, thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, Natasha, Natasha has a question here. What are, what are the things that we can do to help? Excellent question. Oh, we love that question because that's a question of, of being active and not sitting back and being passive. You're saying, I want to get involved and we love that. That is amazing. Uh, where is Natasha? Can I see her? No? Okay. Well, thank you for the question. That is just amazing. What can you do to help? First of all, sign up and become a member of Kherut. Kherut India, Kherut North America, wherever you have citizenship to any country, sign up and become a member of Kherut in all those countries. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, you should sign up for our newsletter. We can send you content. We send what's going on, news, what's going on in Israel, in politics, in public life. If you want the newsletter, you can keep updated about all that. Also, if you have, um, obviously donations, donations are always wonderful if you wanna donate money so we can do more programming in different cities and schools around the world. But also if you wanna do something yourself, if you feel like, okay, you've signed up, now you're a member and you don't necessarily wanna give money but you wanna do something else productive and helpful, you can write for us. If you have things you wanna write, write, our articles, op-ed, send them to us. If you have content, if you're a social media activist, send us your videos, you know, get online and start promoting Israel, start dispelling the lies, be in touch with us. Uh, there's my contact information and obviously go to the, uh, you can speak to Rivka uh, through Hirud India and get all the contact info. We wanna hear from you. We wanna make you a part of the team. So just be in touch, be involved and we can move forward together. That's, that's what I'll say. Thank you, Lauren. I have one question here. Um, perhaps you could help me. When you said just now, uh, Jew-free areas, what are these areas? Where are they situated? And why are they Jew-free to start with? Why, uh, I, I would presume, and this is my presumption, uh, Lauren, that these areas are, are more beneficial for the Arabs, or, you know, for the non-Jews, -Jew but can you just shed some light on that? Sure, that's an excellent question, thank you. So when I say Jew-free areas, these are all areas under the Palestinian Authority or Hamas's control. First of all, Gaza itself is 100% Jew-free. No Jews live there, no Jews are allowed to live there. But Gaza is its own entity. Let's talk about Judea and Samaria within the borders of Israel proper today. The Palestinian Authority government has places where Jews cannot live, which just, they cannot. For example, there are no Jews living in Ramallah. 
So that is a city right down the road from where I live. I can't, uh, not only can I not live there or buy property there, I can't walk in there as a Jew. If I walk in there wearing this necklace, my Magen David necklace, I, God forbid, probably won't come out. My, uh, you know, you see these news stories. I don't know if you see these news stories where uh, a religious Jew accidentally drives into Janine or Bethlehem or Kalkilia or Ramallah and they accidentally took a wrong turn and they drive in there and they almost get lynched. <laughs> People attack them, right? They need to call the army to come save them. And thank God, sometimes they are saved and sometimes not so much. We know historical right. stories uh, of people that were hung, beheaded, shot, just for going into the wrong neighborhoods. This is what I mean by these Jew-free areas. Not only that, but the proposed policies of the Palestinian Authority, they are right out there in saying that we want our own state, we want our own country, we want our own entity, and it is going to be Jew free. You know, Mahmoud Abbas has stated openly, not in, uh, and I quote, not a single Israeli civilian or soldier will step foot on future Palestinian lands. That's a quote from Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority currently, Abu Mazen. That's what he said. He's open about the fact that he wants a Jew free Palestinian state, right? And the fact is, when we look at the rhetoric, the rhetoric surrounding settlements, for example, when they say, oh, Jewish settlements, Jewish houses shouldn't be built in this area, what are they saying? What does that mean when you say to someone, don't build Jewish homes in this area? Why? Because they want it to be a Jew-free area. What's wrong with a Jew building a house and living in a house in a specific area? There's only something wrong with it if the area is supposed to be designated as no Jews allowed. Right, so that's the rhetoric coming from from that side, from those governments, and it's something we deal with on a daily basis. It boils my blood. It makes me very, very mad that in my own country, in my indigenous ancestral homeland, the Holy Land of Israel, I can't walk into Bethlehem next door to me because I will be raped, shot, and set on fire. That bothers me, and it should bother everyone else as well. Just if I may add. Um... And Lauren ans answered beautifully, but just to add a different aspect of it. First of all, the terminology of Jew free comes from the Nazi terminology, Judenrein, which is, you know, an area with no Jews. That's the origin of it. Um, there are still places around the world where there's a city in Morocco that's considered a holy city that Jews are not allowed to enter uh, and um, because it's a holy city. And I can tell you my own personal story right after the Oslo Accords, uh, or not right after, after and after there was the, um, um, the Y Plantation Accords that uh, these two different periods where theoretically the Palestinian Authority was establishing itself and getting stronger and stronger. And there, there was a time span between them. But I remember driving down to the Jordan Valley and um, as a soldier and also as a as a child growing up, we drew we drove through Jericho. You know, it was on the road from the Jordan Valley. You drive through Jericho. It was a friendly city. There was never any animosity between you know the the civilians living in Jericho, Jews and, and Arabs lived peacefully. Suddenly, you know, we drive up there. I was on a, a tour of our um, movement uh, branches down in the Jordan Valley. And there's this massive sign at the entrance that says, no Jews allowed. I can't even explain. I wasn't aware when this, and this was happening. This was real. You're not even aware that something that was so common to drive through these areas and to visit Jericho. Jericho, we're not talking about, you know, Palestinian authority inside cities, which even that is complete, you know, you didn't ride in apartheid, but um, and I remember bursting into tears. I mean, it, it was like, it, we knew the tragedy, but then when you experience the tragedy, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just so much stronger and you, get, you really understand the enormity of, the, of this anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist. It's just like so, it's so, and, uh, and, and I agree with, Lauren wholeheartedly. I mean, there's no place for us to apologize about anything. This is something that needs to be shouted out everywhere. So sorry, there was, because it was a personal story, I had to interject there. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Rivka. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank and, you. And uh, I, Rivka, I got a direct message, a question that said, 
so too, why can't Israel prohibit the Palestinians from its area? So mm -hmm. the answer I would say is because we're better than that. Exactly. We're better than that. And we have no interest in oppression and segregation like that. And whether that is to our own, uh, you know, whether that's good for us or whether it's bad for us at some points, you know, whether it endangers us at some points, it's a fact. We don't believe in segregating people based on race, religion, skin color, ethnicity, doesn't matter. Everyone can live peacefully. As long as people are peaceful to us and they don't want to kill us, we're fine living next to them. And that's a great way to approach things, I think. I think all over the world, we should approach that. Everyone can live next to everyone as long as no one's hurting anyone, no one's trying to kill each other. That's great. Unfortunately, it's a one-sided issue. The oppression, the apartheid, the discrimination is completely one-sided in this regard. It comes only from the enemies of Israel and not from us. I would like to say that 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 statement you made, it's because 70, 80 years ago, we went through the Shoah and we know what it is like to be segregated, you know, and therefore exactly. we don't want to do it. We, you know, we don't want to pay that forward at all. We want it to stop. Exactly. Our people have very recent memory of, of real segregation. And also, even before that, if we go back to antiquity, even in biblical times, you know, there were other people living in the land with us, with the ancient Israelites, you know, the, Mo the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Canaanites. And we actually had no problem living alongside them. Only the problem comes when violence erupts and when other people don't want us there, then all of a sudden, things need to happen, you know, to protect our rights to, to be in the area, but there's no problem living amongst other people. I think it's great. Um, but unfortunately, there's very one-sided discrimination uh, in this country, and it's directed at the Jews, at the Israelis. Liji has a comment here. He says, this is the first time I heard the information shared by Lauren destroying synagogues, churches, et cetera. Please find some way to reach, to reach such news to the masses. Amazing, I'm so glad that makes it all worth it. If even one person uh, took something from today's uh, class, then that's amazing. Yes, this is information and often the media hides this information, right? Because again, it goes against their narrative and it goes against the easy narrative of blaming Israel for everything. But uh, it's very controversial, the fact that in Gaza, they burned down uh, synagogues. Well, there are none left to burn down anymore, but initially they burnt them down before they did their you know, ethnic cleansing. Yes, this is information that should be spread all over the place. And please God, it's on you now as well. It's on you, you've heard it. It's time for you to spread the information as well. Go tell five friends the truth and let's move this information forward. And next time you hear someone lobby the accusation of Israel apartheid or whatever, you can use this information to uh, assert the truth. So thank you so much for, for your comment. I have a question now. Can you, can you explain to the others about the um, Amnesty International? What do they do? Why are they in the news so much? What ruckus oh. are they doing <laughs> on yeah. the media? I would love That's to hear that. That's a good way to put it. They are causing a ruckus. They're causing an unnecessary bulagan. They're involved in shenanigans to no end, with no point. They are a pointless organization. Now, their organization claims to be about human rights. They claim to purport human rights, values, civil, li civil liberties, taking care of different nations around the world and shedding light on genocides and atrocities and yada, 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 yada. Sounds very nice, right? They sound very nice. What they do in actuality is <laughs> they are anti-Semitic. All they do is focus their attention on Israel and ignore, openly ignore the atrocities going on in almost every other country, all right? Almost every other country. Oh, occasionally Amnesty will pass a, a, a little article about the what's going on in North Korea, but they will avoid talking about the, the Uyghur Muslims and they will avoid talking about the child brides in Afghanistan and they will avoid talking about the female genital mutilation in Africa. And they will avoid talking about all the real human rights abuses that are going on around the world because 
They need to focus on Israel. Israel is doing something that they can criticize. So again, it is one of these shell organizations that is a weak, spineless, pseudo organization that started with the intention of doing human rights stuff. It started admirably, almost you could say, and it devolved into an Israel-hating smorgasbord of anti-Semitism, like most other international human rights organizations. I mean, if you just look at the, the UN Human Rights Council, they also are supposed to protect the interests and lives of all the nations around the world. Do they do that? Or do they only pass resolutions that target Israel seemingly baselessly every second day, right? So just like many other organizations, they are a a, a silly nonsense uh, anti-human rights organization with a view to criticizing Israel. Why? Because it's popular. It's really popular to criticize Israel. Hey, babe, how are you? Thank you, Lauren. Galaxy C9 Pro, I wonder who you are, but uh, this is a comment here. It is Torah base to live in peace. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, amen, 100%. Thank that, God. That's, uh, me. Thank that's God. me. Rebecca, that, that was me, Ariella. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ariella. <laughs> you got your answer. <laughs> okay. Amen. Okay, I got a question. I got a question. Can Go I, ahead. Can I? Go okay. ahead. Um, okay, here in Malaysia, um, we, we don't have Herod, so uh, we, we can join India Herod, right? Because there's no way we can have Herod in Malaysia because it's Muslim nation, basically, right? So uh, how do we join? Like if I that's want to actually, join. That's a great question. I actually have a friend in Malaysia who started a very, very small Zionist organization on his university campus. And he was Ooh. telling me, that he was having trouble getting people, getting Jews, because obviously it's very dangerous and there are not many people who want to speak out about it. But maybe I should connect you two as well. And maybe both of you could help begin to grow the community in Malaysia. And yes, obviously join Herut India as well. But maybe in time, yeah, maybe you'll start the Herut Malaysia chapter. Who knows? Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Please you. God. Amen. Yeah, awesome. So, so be, be in touch, stay in touch. And uh, I'm serious. Let's, let's move forward with some programming. Yes, sure. I'm, I'm, awesome. I'm game for it. Awesome. Woo. <laughs> Amen. Um, I just like to say this, you know, Malaysia is one of the most anti-Semitic countries other than Turkey, even Indonesia is better. And, um, Ariella, what's your experience? Can you just tell the others, what is your experience as a Malaysian, you know, um, a Torah believer in Malaysia and how do you navigate yourself through this whole thing? You know, I just like to know how, do, do uh, people look at you differently or do, do they know that you are, uh, you know, a Torah, Torah believer? Uh, is there a, a, a safety problem? Uh, something like that. Can you can you just let us know? I'd like to okay. hear that. All right. I think uh, Alan is also there. He's also Malaysian. Um, here for us, my husband and I, we started um, keeping Shabbat and uh, started going into uh, understanding more Judaism. Obviously, the first thing, um, just just a just a small thing to say. I truly didn't like Israel nor did I like the Jews once upon a time, okay? So because I didn't understand the whole concept being a, uh, when I was a Christian. But when I, when I started, when I went to Israel and when Hashem put in my heart, the understanding of the nation and the people, there was this deep love that started growing. But how do I, the, how do, I do all this in Malaysia? Number one, we, we try not to attract any, any um, trouble, like, uh, we don't, like we don't go on, on uh, outside there, uh, like uh, flagging, like we have Israel flag in our house, but obviously we don't show it out and stuff like that, or Star of David and stuff like that. But um, one thing that I've noticed is there are a lot of uh, friends, uh, not many, a few, um, even like a, a Hindu or, or, a, uh, or a Buddhist or even Muslims, not, not, I mean, like one, two Muslims that I know of, they agree that Israel 
is doing the right thing and they have the right to leave. And especially when there is a war, uh, when there is trouble in Israel between, um, between Hamas, you know, the rockets flying and all, oh, we will get all kind of things going on here in Malaysia. I think Malaysia is one of the highest in, uh, uh, in Asia, I would say, like, you know, hate Israel and everything is so openly, like, you know, everybody must support Palestinian, we support Palestinian. And I told my friend, why are you saying we? I am a Malaysian, but I'm not supporting Palestinian. They, they, are, they are not doing the right thing. And then my, my friend will say that, no, we, we have to say that, otherwise it's not safe. I said, nobody is killing me here. So it's like, I, I just be careful in what I say, but, um, but at the same time, my, my, my interest is to bring the awareness to uh, friends, very especially to some Christian friends, not all Christian friends, but some Christian friends who are not aware of this. They, they also join hand with the, uh, the understanding that the land of uh, Israel belong to, the, the, to Hamas or Palestinian because Bethlehem belong to Jesus, you know, that kind of concept they go on. So these are the areas I think that many of my friends, especially my Christian friends, they need to know, they need to be educated to know this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ariella. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank well, you so much it. for sharing that. It's so interesting to hear about the different forms of anti-Semitism around the world. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we close, is there any questions, comments? I think you all are happy that we had a, a good meeting today and a lot of information and um, discussion to and fro. Um, can we close this meeting? Or is Thank there you. anyone, anyone with, a, with a more comments? Rivka. Yes. Rivka. Shalom. Uh, shalom, Dr. Dr. Walsh. Shalom, shalom. I'm sorry I got in late, but I just want to stress the importance that we are a people. We are a people of multiple lands, of multiple races, and we are together and we support each other. We're not just a religion. We are yes. bound by customs and the religion. And we have from its very beginning been, been a multiracial group and that has formed a super race, meaning a race of multiple people ourselves bound by our religion and culture and don't let anyone try and separate us out into just a religion we are a people that believes in multiple things okay but we are a people no matter where we are we and are one of the first physically. orders that god gave abraham was i will make of you a great nation we're a nation no matter where we live so we kind of part of the same here. nation we are people we are a nation we started out Zipporah was from Ethiopia Moses was not from Ethiopia but we were all the same God's children and a race and a people amen amen just my thoughts thank wow. you Zawalski. president of Herut North America and national board members from Herut North America Wow. Thank you so much for joining I, I, us. I guess. didn't hear quite what you said, but. And Rivka, I want to thank you so much for having me today. You always put on amazing events and you're doing wonderful things in India. Keep up the great Zionist work. You're making the Jewish people proud. Thank my you. My pleasure, Lauren. My pleasure. And thank you so much for taking time out from all different zones. You know, it's amazing. I think we have five countries here. So. Thank you. And um, is there any more questions, any more comments before we wrap it up? Okay, so thank you so much, Karma. Thank you. The thank leadership you. team from US, my fellow Herutniks in India, my friends in Malaysia. Thank you so much, Tarima Kase. And um, I hope to see you all soon next month. And uh, have a good day at work. Those in the West and in the East, Laila Tov, take care. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Lauren. Love Thank you much. Laila Tov. Thank you. Thank you, Karma. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ripka. Thank you, Ripka. Thank you, Laila Tov.
לילה טוב.